Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Cook County Board of Commissioners regular meeting today, Tuesday, February 28th, 2023. And if we would stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So as we get started this morning, are there any adjustments to the agenda? Any changes to the agenda? Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve the agenda. Thank you so much, Commissioner Mills. Is there support? Thank you, Commissioner Hawkins. We have a motion and support. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. All right, we ha now have our public comment period. This is an opportunity to have citizens appear before the county board. Are there in any uh, citizens this morning that would like to speak? <coughs> I see Arvis Thompson, if you'd come forward. There's a sheet where you can sign in your name and address, and you can come up to address the board. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm asking some questions of clarification on minutes and notes that I've gotten in the last couple of weeks. Uh, one of them is um, February 14th minutes. Uh, it talks about the compensation study, and the statement or the it, it reads the cost for the compensation study. And to go on, um, it says. Are you referring to the cost of the study itself, or are you referring to the cost of implementing the study? It, just a point of clarification that I wasn't sure. Okay. Um, regarding that uh, compensation study, I also would like some clarification on how the study was done. Specifically, were jobs compared to very like jobs? For instance, uh, I mean, we're talking about 20 counties. If a maintenance man in County A was compared to a maintenance man in County D, were the job descriptions the same? So you were comparing the same? Or was it a general category without regard to what the really details are of those jobs? <coughs> and if they um, weren't the same, then how did you justify or compensate for the fact that they were the same but very different. And I also was wondering, were benefits compared in that study or was it just the wage, hourly wage that a person received? Benefit packages in counties are very, very different. And if they weren't compared in that study, then why not? Um, let's see. On February 21st, there was some talk about the recycling center and going to North Shore Waste and doing some combining, maybe getting rid of the, rid of the recycling center. And I was wondering what, um, what does the recycling center really cost the county? And if you were to get rid of the center, would you also get rid of the budget shop or would you see a way to keep that community um, entity in place. It does serve a lot of people that the other two do not and cannot. It's okay. You and I see heads nodding like you. You really understand the value of that budget shop and what the, what they've done and what they can do. Um, and I would encourage you if you think about keeping it to actually expand it. There's a lot of stuff out there that she can't handle, um, and a little more space would give it her a whole another um, benefit to the community. Much much more than what the, the two currently existing do. And it might even pay for itself. Um, there was also a discussion, let's see, let me get to page 30 of that one. It was under the personnel committee um, meeting of January 17th. 
And they're talking about um, an employee handbook and definitions. And I'm wondering, um, are they going to define what is a spouse? Um, are they going to look at, um, you're talking about five days of non-consecutive paid leave, um, for whom? Is it marriage that brings a family together? Is it um, living together? Five days of non-consecutive once a year? What, what does all of that mean? Um, I, I see a lot of possibilities there for clarification. And then I'm also wondering, why um, would you do a, <coughs> how is it worded here? <coughs> performance review. Why would you do a performance review on a commissioner or on an elected official? Elected officials get performance reviews quite often by the fact that they're either elected or not reelected. Um, and if you're going to do that, then because they're public officials, does that become public information? All right, well, thank you. And um, I've made note of all six of those questions and remarks, and we'll get back to you. Thank you thank so you. much. Appreciate it. Are there any other members of the public that would like to speak? I'm not a public. I just a follow up. And following up on her questions, if we could, I mean, those are questions that many people in the community might have, uh, uh, particularly about the uh, budget shop and then the uh, uh, wage study or job descriptions, just <coughs> some clarifications there. And I think um, those are two issues that the general public is, are well aware of. And have a lot of questions about so if we could respond to that at publicly to those questions it would be very helpful all right um, have any commissioners received public comment any items that need to be read I did check with administrator Yorkie uh, yesterday he did not have anything at that time and um, I just want to make note that he has a family matter today and is unable to attend, but is um, hoping that he will be back within the week. All right, um, we will close our public comment period and move on to our consent agenda items. Anything a commissioner would like to pull? <coughs> Madam Chair, I'd like to make a, mo a motion to approve the consent agenda as a whole. Thank you, Commissioner Mills. Is there support? Support. Thank you, Commissioner Storley. We have a motion and support. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. I do want to make a comment regarding the um, minutes. There was a correction in the minutes, and I want to um, thank Commissioner Mills for kind of having a discussion with me a week ago as we were sitting here talking about potassium chloride and it's potassium acetate. Mm -hmm. um, I did check with the highway department and wanted to make sure we were talking about the correct chemical. <coughs> um, so that is in the minutes as potassium acetate. I wanted to clarify that. And we did, uh, Commissioner Mills, check a little bit on the safety of that product. And um, I'll just read to you. Potassium acetate is one of the most environmental friendly de-icers de that's available on a level that's useful for public agencies, primarily because it's biodegradable and chlorides are not. There was a study put out that called potassium acetate out for being less green than first thought. However, this study was in reference to direct liquid applications to the road at rates far higher than what we in Cook County apply to our stand. So that's the difference. All right. We will move on now to more highway matters and ask for Robbie Hass to come forward. He has a couple of important topics to discuss with us this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, potassium acetate discussions over the weekend are always good. Yes. Um, <laughs> we're happy the to exciting talk more life about. of a commissioner. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we'll start. Both of these kind of go hand in hand, um, you know, kind of an annual update on presentation or on uh, projects. 
but also our um, five-year bridge priority resolution. Um, and what that is is just a revolving five-year resolution that says, here's the bridges we are committing to replace. Um, why is that important? Uh, when I submit applications for bridge bonds, um, you know, through the state, or even sometimes different grant applications, we'll ask for that type of thing. Just shows the county's commitment to doing the work. Um, and so the first, yeah, so we'll start with that priority resolution. Um, what, what's kind of neat, and, and I've talked about this before, is obviously we you know, have uh, a lot of bridges that are eligible to be replaced in this county. Um, you know, we have 61, I think, right now. When I got here, we had 14. You know, it's about a quarter, a little under, but about a quarter of our bridges um, as a bridge person. That's my background. Uh, that was rather embarrassing. No other county is like that. Uh, most counties have one or two uh, that are eligible to be replaced. So anyways, we're down to 10 or 11. Um, and so my goal, uh, you know, I set out to try and figure out a way to get these as replaced as fast as humanly possible. And so I think by 2026 or 2027, uh, we'll be able to do that. Um, <coughs> most of the funding is either known whether we, you know, transition the roads to a UT road. We've talked about that a lot. Um, that pulled eight or nine bridges off of our levy and put them into the town bridge category, which was great. We get money from the state to do that. Um, I've already seen a lot of benefits from that. You know, I think close to over, yeah, about $2 million in benefits already uh, just for putting up a few signs um, and doing that. So that was huge, um, and that'll pay dividends forever. Um, so I guess, does anybody have any questions about the, the bridge priority resolution for now? I do not. I just want to thank you for all your work. Um, I feel much more secure driving over several bridges <laughs> <laughs> now in Cook County, and we're looking forward to maybe 2027 um, being all caught up. So thanks. Commissioner Hawkins. Thank you. Um, just for the public, I mean, yeah. we had a very good discussion up in Hoagland on Saturday about bridges and how we make that decision. And um, we have a couple bridges on this resolution that does not have an LPI. We learned about LPI on yes. Saturday. So can we explain to the public why those we have two bridges on that sure. list? Sure, absolutely. Because uh, right now they aren't bridges. Uh, they're culverts. Um, or it's a brand new bridge, so nothing's there. So the two uh, that you're probably looking at, and I guess I'll cheat and look at my list just to make sure. Um, one is for a project we're doing up in Grand Portage this summer, actually. It's getting reviewed, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, but it's getting reviewed by the state right now. It's the Mile Creek Road or Upper Road where those connect um, realignment. And so what we're doing is taking traffic off of that historic stone bridge and moving it, you know, removing the whole road to create uh, a new alignment for vehicular traffic. The stone bridge stays put. Uh, but it just becomes a pedestrian bridge at that point in time. And so the reason that that project doesn't have an LPI is because there's currently no bridge there. Um, an LPI means? Local planning index. And so what that, fair enough. Uh, so local <laughs> planning index is, it, it's kind of a new thing to be fair. Before what they did with bridges was they would just look at the structure itself and give it a rating um, and say, you know, this box culvert uh, is considered structurally deficient. We've talked about that even in the past. Um, and so therefore it has a, a you know, a structural deficiency rating of whatever, 50, pick a number, um, and say, you know, okay, anything 50 and under could be replaced. And so what LPI is now is it not only looks at the structure, but looks at where it's located. So for example, a, a bridge that's on a dead end road, that pays, that would have a huge impact on everybody that lives on that road. And that LPI, yeah, so it looks at the structure quality and then also considers where it is and then gives it a score out of 100. And so and it, I think um, if I remember correctly, like Cross River and Carlson Creek, for example, two bridges we did and we'll talk about, but last summer had sufficiency ratings, structural ratings. I think they were, I don't know, in the 20s or 30s each. And that was just about the structure itself. When the LPI got incorporated, that dropped that rating down to about a 14 and a 16 or something like that out of 100 because they're both on dead end roads uh, way in the middle of nowhere. And so if those were uh, to wash out, for example, everybody on the other side of that bridge would be affected. So it's a very 
Short question, long answer. <laughs> Does that make sense, though? Yes. And yeah. so the Stone Bridge and Grand Portage, mm -hmm. that's the only way in and out. Correct. And so that is pretty important to Absolutely. not lose. Absolutely. <clears throat> exactly. And so that's where, you know, in working with, um, you know, the, the park up there and, and the band, you know, that's where we started working on this project almost right when I got here a couple of years ago. Um, you know, that bridge itself, the historic bridge, isn't eligible to be replaced, probably, you know, and, and nor would it be replaced because it's historic, but any rehab and stuff like that. Um, and so it was nice, though, as we all started working on this project a few years ago to get it to this point now um, where we can do it and we can do it you know, with a lot of confidence where we've had archeological surveys done up there to help us put in the road alignment. You know, we've had input from the band and from the BIA and from the park to help us, you know, navigate basically threading the needle through this very archeological heavy site. Um, and so to the best of our knowledge, you know, we'll know more once shovels are in the ground, you know, obviously. Um, but, you know, we have a great working partnership and a great team assembled on this project where you know, I think I've lost track of all the acronyms, uh, gov different government agencies that have been involved with that particular project. Um, so moving the vehicles off that bridge, though, really help preserve it in the long term, mm -hmm. for sure. And not only preserve the stone bridge, but make it safer for all the pedestrians yes. that are up there. Mm -hmm. uh, summer months, it's a very, very busy location and um, kind of a, a confluence of a lot of traffic. So. Yes. Yeah, that'll be good. And that's a, yeah, we, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, project here in a little bit, actually, um, in, our, in, in the update. But um, yeah, for now, that is why some of these structures don't have LPIs. And then the other one, Otis Creek, is currently a culvert. So a, cul a bridge is anything that spans 10 feet and more. Mm -hmm. So culverts are anything under that. And that just gets into semantics at this point, but it's important. And so that's why that one doesn't have an LPI either, is because right now it's a culvert. Other questions or comments? If not, is there a motion to approve our resolution? So moved. Thank you, Commissioner Hawkins. Is there support? Support. Thank you, Commissioner White. We have a motion and support. Any further discussion? All in favor? All right. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries <coughs> unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very much. So next wait for that thing to pop up there and use our fancy clicker now there we go so I can't believe it's already been three years but <laughs> here we go third annual project update uh, so what we'll go over is kind of well here I guess I can does the clicker work <laughs> turning it on generally helps and now what that was the off button. <laughs> oh, now it's on. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. The comp the laser works. Oh, the laser works. Come on. This one? Does it have to be in like, is there like a presenter mode or something? I think it, isn't it like really sensitive to the um, computer or something? Let's try that. Hmm? Try holding Where it next to your laptop instead of pointing it at the. Well, it's not on mine. It's on that one. Oh. Yeah. So. We'll just go old school, and I'll say next. <laughs> next. Now, old school would be with the chalkboard. That's up fair. Here. We could do that too. I'll start doodling <laughs> on the screen. <laughs> annual project update all right here we go <laughs> uh, so what we'll go over we'll go over a 2022 recap of the projects that were done and completed um, 2023 what that summer is looking like 
um, some design services that were awarded. We've talked a lot in the past about consultants, and I think um, you know, at, at our town hall that we had up in Hovland, some folks just had some general questions. Why do we use consultants? Um, and so it was a great conversation on that. So we'll, we'll talk about some of those coming up and then just overall quick summary of, of everything we went over. Uh, so looking back, so we'll start up at Cross River. I already talked about that a little bit this morning, uh, but that was one of our uh, UT roads. So unorganized territory roads that lets us access town bridge funds through the state. Um, and so the reason we did that was to remove a big levy burden off of our small tax base. And so right away after doing that, you can see the original bid on this project uh, from Redstone Construction came in at 1.397, and I'll go that many decimal places because then the work certified to date is 1.398. So very much on track with that one. Um, the reason why we say we hold 1% since, since it is substantially complete is if things kind of drag, not drag on, but go into the fall and um, the reseeding, the vegetation hasn't had to grow enough yet, we'll leave in like the silt fence and some other of these kind of preventative measures, erosion control measures, leave that in so that everything has a chance to green up. And so then they'll come back this next summer and as long as everything stays greening up, um, pull that and we'll close out the project and be done. Um, so, I mean, all things considered, that project is done. Turned out beautiful. The first slide in this presentation was actually that project. Um, so it was a three-span timber bridge and we put back a three-span timber bridge. So it was very, very nice. Wonderful working with Redstone uh, construction on that one. Uh, Carlson Creek, so on Moose Valley Road, uh, over more on the east end there. Another one of UT roads that we talked about. And so Ulan Brothers uh, won that bid. Uh, they hadn't done up work up here in, in a number of years, and so it was nice to have them back up. Um, I always like a good contractor competition. Uh, and so it's nice to have, well, the more we have, the better, you know. Um, and so the original bid on that one came in, you can see about $440,000. Final cost on that project was about $415,000. Um, and so the, the short of it is they essentially dug a smaller hole than we thought uh, to put back, um, to pull out and then put back the project. So everything went great. Um, that one they were able to complete early enough in the summer where things greened up enough. And so we are all done. That one is done. It's a nice project to get done. Both those two bridges for what it's worth, I think we're in the top five in the state, if I remember right, is, is worst. Uh, bridges. So not a good accolade, but now that we're not on that list anymore, so that's good. Yeah. Pike Lake Road. It's the last time I'll talk about it. No. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Um, it's a wonderful project. This is one, you know, it needed to be done, and, and there's other roads in the county that are, that are similar to this as far as needing work um, or needing, you know, just, just basic, like it just needs to be a road. It's not a cart path. It needs to be a road. Um, and so this was one that was uh, financed through bonding through our transportation sales tax funds. Um, and so KGM ended up winning this one. Uh, you can see the original bid was a little bit under 4.4 million. Um, because we had some wiggle room with this project, I actually added things to it. Um, and so right now the work certified to date were just under four and a half million dollars. Um, because the project kind of went a long time, most of it is done. Uh, what they're going to come back and do this coming summer is the chloride treatment. Um, and so what that is, is there, it's not only spraying, you know, normally in the county we spray a cap of calcium chloride on the roads because uh, we have a material issue on our roads. We don't have enough material to actually grind it in because what you should do is spray it, grind it, and then put a cap on. And so that's what we have to do on this project still is that next summer. But there won't be any detours. Um, and so once road bands are off sometime mid-June, July, things have had a chance to dry out, <laughs> that's what it takes, <laughs> um, is we'll come back and finish up this project. So it's a beautiful project, um, looks great. I encourage everyone, if you haven't been out there already, go check it out. Um, do it before the snow melts, because it's just construction and it's gonna be kind of ugly once it melts, but right now it looks great. <laughs> <coughs> um, our safe routes to school multi-use trail. Uh, it's very visible, you can see that from Highway 61 up to County Road 7 there. Uh, that was one uh, paid for through, we had a grant, uh, Safe Routes to School grant, and then also MUSA funds, uh, Municipal State <coughs> Aid Highway funds. It's in the same vein as CUSA, construction 
or county state aid highway. The M just means anything within Grand Marais, we can spend money on that. Uh, so KGM won that contract. Uh, you can see the original bid, it's just under 264,000. And again, the work certified to date, meaning we just need things to green up a bit, uh, is 258,000. So very much on track, all things considered, that project is done. 2023. 2023 will be very busy for us. Um, Sawbill Creek, that's one that we've talked about quite a bit in the past. Uh, we've actually had to delay it a little bit, um, but this is an exciting one to get done. Uh, so this one, this particular project is one that is purely levy dependent. It's not a town bridge. Um, you know, our townships, as, as we all know, I think go pretty much all the way up to the boundary waters line. Um, and so what that does is we can't make it a township or a UT one or even that. And so this ends up being a purely levy dependent TST funded project. Um, I'm very happy that this is a project where we actually have enough in our savings account, uh, in our bridge savings account to do the project. Um, and so, yeah, we put it out for bid and Northland Constructors will be coming up this summer. Uh, and the awarded bid was uh, about six, a little under $620,000 for that one. So it'll be a double barrel box culvert as well. Junko Creek. Uh, this is another one just north of Double Track Road that I think has been on the books for a very, very long time. Um, and you can see this one's kind of fun. There's a whole bunch of different funding sources with it. This is actually the first grant I ever applied for was the State Park Road account one, and we actually got awarded it, so I was pretty excited about that. Um, but you can see we have a DNR grant. We have a National Fish Passage Program grant. Uh, that was a wonderful uh, collaboration with our Soil and Water uh, Conservation District folks, so I appreciate that. Um, CRISA funds, that comes, I, I don't know that act, is COVID relief, something, something. Anyways, yeah. Highway departments across the state uh, directly got COVID money. That's the, night, the short way to say it. Um, and so that was our uh, contribution is $124,000 is what we got. Um, and then if there is any leftover, um, we do have enough in our bridge savings account or the TST fund to, to cover it. And so actually this project, our, we open up uh, the bids this afternoon at two o'clock. And so we'll, we'll know a cost for that project once that comes up. Fifth Avenue West, big project in town. Um, had several public meetings talking about it, all very well attended, which is, which is great. Um, it's gonna be a, a big project and require quite a bit of communication on our end with folks because there's so much utility work. Um, so we're working on developing a means for that. We'll probably end up with you know, a construction trailer with a bulletin board, something like that. Maybe website, maybe mailers, trying to figure out something, best means. But I feel like having a hard place for people to go to, you know, trailer, schedule, you know, to me that's kind of a nice focal point. Um, and so we'll, we'll start with that. This one also has several different funding sources to it. This is another grant that we had applied for, uh, the Local Road Improvement Program, LRIP. Uh, it was $835,000 that we were awarded. Again, working with soil and water. Um, we are able to secure uh, another grant for $200,000. And so then the remainder will be uh, picked up through our, our state aid allocations, whether it's the <coughs> county state aid highway or municipal state aid highway. Um, both of those will, 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 will cover the remainder of the project. That's another bid opening that we have today at two o'clock or 210 because I have to do the other one at two o'clock. So. <laughs> We have two facilities going in at our main campus at the highway department. Uh, one is a salt sand shed and one is a heated storage facility. Uh, the salt sand shed, uh, we were able to complete the design um, and award it to Northland Constructors already. So that was $741,000. It's a combination of state aid funds and then our undesignated fund balance. That kind of gets into the weeds of some things, but we've talked about undesignated fund balance in the past. Um, it's a reserve fund that we have at the highway department that helps us in emergency situations, but also when we apply for, you know, and hopefully get uh, federal grants, federal grants are reimbursable. So <coughs> you pay your bill, you're on the hook for it, and then you get reimbursed maybe a week later. And so that allows us to go after these grants, pay for projects, and still, you know, be competitive um, in the grant application process. So Salt Sand Shed got awarded, um, and then our heated storage building, we're finalizing the design right now. I'm hoping to have that done shortly. Yes? One question, sure. just where does the un, 
Where does the fund balance come from? How does that show up? Sometimes, uh, so what we have is we've been kind of trying to rebuild that over the past few years, because um, at one point it was zero, uh, which really inhibits what we can do. <coughs> and so whether it's, you know, little, if at the end of the year, um, you know, we didn't spend all of our levy money, for example, sometimes that rolls over into it, or we have a line item to allocate directly to it, uh, so that we are able to have kind of that nest egg for lack of a better term with us. So you're saying saying that every year you put money into this account and saving for yes. future. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Madam Chair. Yes, Commissioner Stone. Thank you. Yeah. Um, can you give us kind of the size of this um, storage for sand? I look at the one that MnDOT has. Is it that big? No, or? it is not that big. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we use substantially less uh, sand than they do. Um, and so I'm trying to remember the size of at least the slab. I want to say we made it longer so we're able to drive a truck up onto it and everything's mm -hmm. on a nice level surface. I want to say it's roughly 90 by 30, somewhere in that vein, 90 by 40, um, something like that. But not that whole thing isn't covered. There's an approach slab. So like I said, the trucks can drive up on it and then it also helps prevent spillage too um, into the ground. So everything mm -hmm. is going to be on a slab. Mm -hmm. And how is the sand supply holding out this year? We're low. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've talked about that quite a lot lately. Uh, it's an interesting winter. Obviously, we all know how slippery it is. Um, but even, you know, I've only, this is my third winter, and all three winters have been completely different, yeah. which is fascinating to me. This one has just been an ice rink. It's probably how I'll remember it as last year. We all remember last year. Um, just record levels of snow. And then my first year here was actually very, very light. Um, mm -hmm. So it's kind of funny to deal with these three completely different winters, um, but yeah. Working you up to it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, another bridge placement in the east end, and so there's, there's several Flute Reed River bridges that we have in our inventory. Uh, so this one is located on the north road, and then the Flute Reed in this case crosses the north road at three different locations, and so this one is the middle one for whatever that's worth. And so if you go from the intersection with um, the Arrowhead Trail and you go west, you go over one bridge, which is relatively new. It's not that one. It's the one after it. That kind of looks like it needs to be replaced. Um, so that's this one. This is a combination of federal money and then uh, state bonds, actually, motor vehicle, deal, motor vehicle lease sales tax funds. And so again, when I had mentioned our undesignated fund ba balance and having uh, money to pay our bills basically for these. This is a great example of why um, this project is, you know, eight, you know, a little under nine hundred thousand uh, dollars. Will probably take three months or so to do. Um, and so, if you know, you start kind of subtracting some money around, we have to be on the hook not for nine hundred thousand dollars all at once, uh, but for those monthly bills. So three, four hundred thousand uh, dollars. We get reimbursed, like I said, probably within a week or so. Uh, but it's still good to have that on hand. That's why we can do it. Um, Again, this was Northland Constructor. So far, they're doing quite a bit of work up here uh, this coming summer, which is exciting. Um, yeah, that'll be a good one. This one will have a detour on it as well. There won't be a bypass. And we talked about that at the town hall over the weekend. Um, it really limits the impact of the project. Um, and I'm hoping they're able to actually do it a little bit faster, too, than, than the 90 days. Uh, so this will be detoured. The road will be closed at that location. Uh, so get that further out into the world outside of the town hall where we talked about it. <clears throat> um, talked about our Grand Portage project a little while ago. Uh, it was Mile Creek Road realignment. So you can kind of see uh, what we're proposing is scooting the road a little bit north. Um, the historic bridge stays put um, and we're constructing a brand new bridge. So it'll be another um, three span timber bridge that will go in there. Um, Funding is supplied through our, our state aid allocation and also uh, federal lands transportation program dollars, FLTP. Uh, and so um, right now that project is under the state aid review process. Um, what we're doing with this project is actually that intersection with Store Road will get scooched a little further south. Um, it'll turn into a three-way stop. Um, and then you can see the project kind of meanders up through there, um, kind of where the old maintenance shed was up, up there in the park uh, and then connect back. And so the old road will be kind of reclaimed or cut back to just be a pedestrian path. Um, and then I think there's future plans and this would be between the park 
in the band, but to kind of turn that area, that 90 degree bend into some type of parking area. Um, but that's outside of our project and that's you know completely on, on them into the future. So exciting project, great collaboration, great partnership on that one. Uh, moving into design services. So this is just design services that we've awarded this year um, or some that we're doing in-house. And so we do do work in-house, believe it or not. Uh, <laughs> we don't do big projects in-house. We just don't have the capacity to do that. Um, but some of these smaller ones, we can. Um, so kind of going back into the North Road area up on Camp 20, actually, we have a bridge there. It's a town, uh, qualifies as a town bridge. Uh, it's on uh, Camp 20 Road. It's the lower Camp 21. So basically right when you turn off the North Road, there's a culvert that's there right now. That one's in pretty rough shape. Uh, and so we're working on that design right now. Uh, actually, the hydraulic model is being finalized and we're going through different structure type options. Once we have that, we can keep progressing with the plans. Plan with that is 2024 construction. Uh, so we're just trucking along with that one so far. Uh, and then the next one we're doing in-house is the Gunflint multi-use trail. Uh, we've had one public meeting about that. Um, and then I think we've talked about it quite a bit. Um, but so this trail would kind of continue that safe routes to school one uh, and it would go up up the Gunflint Trail kind of behind my office and the, the school and connect down Fifth Avenue in front of the recycling center there. Uh, we've put in two grant applications. One is with the state uh, through the AT program, the active transportation program. And then another one is through the feds, which is the TA program, transportation alternatives program. Why they had to pick the same Letters, I don't know, but <laughs> that really clarifies things a lot. Um, if we get the state one, we're on track to construct in 2024. If we get the federal one, we're on track to construct in 2025. Um, for the federal one, we have until 2027 to do it, uh, but we're trucking through the design right now, which is great. Uh, some projects that we had to call people for. Uh, so this one, Tofty Park Road. Uh, that one's been talked about for quite a while. Um, that right now is kind of one of the poorest actually pavement ratings on our county road system. We don't have a lot of pavement on our county road system, but this is probably one of the, I think it's one of the bigger chunks. Um, and so uh, MSA was awarded this one for just under $65,000. The plan is to uh, utilize TST funds for construction and we're hoping for 2024. Um, Right now, we're kind of finalizing some scope things. Uh, there should be, in the near term, there'll be enough uh, public engagement sessions and that type of thing to where that can come out. Um, and we'll have plenty of time to talk with the public about that one. Uh, Devil Track Road. So this is the end of Devil Track Road. Um, really the part that is considered County State Aid Highway number eight. And so it's the end of the pavement, basically from Ball Club Road West um, to where the pavement ends. And so that is another terrible stretch of pavement on our state aid system. Uh, and so uh, it's a good one to get done. Nice little neighborhood road. I know there's a you know, large contingency of people that live back there. Obviously there's a lot of seasonal homes as well. Um, and so LHB was awarded this design contract for about $110,000. Um, we did apply for uh, state park road account funds with this one. Uh, and so I haven't heard back yet, I think this spring is when we'll, springtime is when they kind of notify us on a lot of things. So we'll know if we get it then. Um, but again, 2024 construction on that one, I would expect quite a bit of public engagement as well. Two more bridges. Uh, so the Pine River Bridge, way at the end of the Arrowhead Trail. Um, I think it might be the furthest one away from my office, I'm not sure. It's either that one or Sawbill, <laughs> way up there. <laughs> Um, so that's another town bridge project, which is great. Um, Erickson Engineering was awarded that one for uh, just over $68,000. Uh, again, town bridge funds, and we expect 2025 construction on that one. Spruce Creek uh, is another one uh, down near the Cascade River State Park. Uh, another town bridge, uh, so money that doesn't have to come out of our uh, small levy base. Uh, again, Erickson Engineering was awarded that one for uh, just under 63000 and we're hoping for 2024 construction on that one. Summary. So you can see we're doing a lot <laughs> all over the county. Uh, in 2022 construction, 
you know, we we're looking at, you know, approximately a little over six and a half million dollars of work that got done. Um, in 2023, we're, you know, looking at just, just shy of $11 million. Um, design services are just what we talked about today. It's probably about 5.3 million in construction. Um, and so you can see there's a lot, there's a lot to do. I love job security and I don't like being bored. So, <laughs> um, that's all I have. That was a lot. Does anybody have any questions, comments, concerns? Questions or comments? Commissioner Mills. Thank you, Madam Chair, and <coughs> thank you, Robbie. Um, awesome, per, <laughs> per usual. Uh, I just had a, a question, a general sure. question, and forgive me for not remembering exactly the, the timeline of the process, but about what's the ideal length of time between a bid and a project? Bid and a project. Oh, like when we like award and then when well, it Well, like your bid. opening bids today. Yes. And then so, and then the, the project. I mean, oh, it's this summer. So yeah. it's very much if I can, my, my ideal timeline is if I can get stuff out in the fall for bid and award it typically in the fall or early winter, mm -hmm. then it's getting constructed that following summer. Okay. Uh, then we're very much first in line on, con right. you know, because you figure fall, you know, October, contractors are probably wrapping up work and looking for things. And so that's my ideal scenario. The timing on the, what we have left to put out for bid this year, I think we're still good. I know things are ramping up quite a bit, and so that's where you know opening stuff today is great because it's already been out in the world for about a month or so, um, and so we kind of locked. You know, the, the earlier we can get stuff out, the better. Typically, it's that following summer, though. Thank you, mm -hmm. Commissioner White. You had your hand raised. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Um, at the uh, Saturday event, you were questioned at, about rinsing off bridges. Getting, yes. And uh, evidently, in larger counties, more staff, more budget, mm -hmm. um, road crews rinse the accumulated salts or, uh, off of the bridges mm -hmm. to, uh, exp to extend the life of the bridges. Sure. One thing we do not, that does not happen here. Nope, we sweep ours. We sweep ours. But the one thing I did think about mm -hmm. after the fact was that in other municipalities, the spring thaw comes a little sooner than, and the road dams go off a little sooner than June mm -hmm. or July or <laughs> whenever that happens. Depends the road, but yeah. And so that would be a real issue. I mean, okay, so we're going to spray down the bridges in what? March? April? <laughs> uh, like May? <laughs> so I would just, I had thought about that and mm -hmm. I thought, oh, why would we do that? There, there's a lot of different, and it gets down to, like you just alluded to, of, of resources and time and, and what you can do. Um, you know, there's a similar question about chip sealing. Why don't we chip seal? Uh, cost and time you know we, we have limited resources up here to do that type of preventative maintenance um, if I could do it all I would love to um, but we look at kind of you know what can we do you know so I talked about crack sealing over the weekend you know and we did that recently if everyone remembers the toilet paper that was on some of our roads that um, <laughs> it there is was, toilet there, paper yeah there's tar underneath there but yeah it is yeah it is well <laughs> Basically, it's just one ply, though. That's why it's just single ply. Yeah, no, we're not <laughs> charming on the roads. Um, <laughs> anyways, this, this went off tracks. Um, but yeah, we, we just kind of have to pick and choose, you know, up here, especially like you know, like you said, with resources, what we can and can't do. Um, and so, you know, crack sealing is an easy one right up front to do. That makes a big difference. Um, chip sealing would certainly be helpful. But um, at this time, I don't think we have the, the resources for it. And so what we'll probably look at doing, what I've been considering is, you know, like I mentioned, the crack ceiling after year one or two. Um, and then really at that point, you know, you're looking at a mill and overlay potentially at year 20, um, which, which is common, which is fine. Um, roads do last a while when you take care of them. <laughs> um, and so hopefully we can get to that point, but yeah. Commissioner Mills. Thank you, Madam Chair. What is chip sealing? Uh, it's like a thin, what do I want to call it, veneer, thin layer that gets put on top of the road, basically. Oh, the whole road? Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? 
Well, I just want to thank you for your wonderful annual update. It's always good to kind of review what we've been doing and think about where we're headed. And thank you. We appreciate all your good work. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks. And we have another annual update. And Rowan Watkins is going to be coming forward to share with us um, information from our management information system. Good morning. Good morning. Tough act to follow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so today we'll be doing our annual MIS update. Which is MIS. It's in there. Management, management information, information system. I'm coming. We need people to hear it. Not everyone is looking online or watching live. MIS 2023 update. This is the agenda, and uh, I'll try to cover all of these, but not necessarily in this order. And so we'll start with an overview of MIS, or Management Information Systems. And that's our department, and our, our stated mission is to provide technology solutions that enhance the delivery of county services we're made up of three distinct service areas or divisions in our department and that's it or information technology uh, gis or geographical information systems and then radio communications uh, no acronym for that one <laughs> <laughs> come up with one uh, <laughs> good <laughs> so these Three distinct divisions uh, could be and often are in other counties in other departments, but we, we get and see a lot of value in managing them together. And I'll, I'll just go over each one sort of high level uh, before we move on here. IT includes our internal network, things like leased fiber, uh, servers, firewalls, switches, the infrastructure that connects our buildings and systems and secures our data. Uh, it also includes the procurement and integration and support of end user equipment and software. So things like laptops, PCs, uh, phones, email, productivity applications like uh, Microsoft Teams, Office 365, SharePoint, our help desk, and a whole host of department specific applications. And then GIS is everything geospatial or map based. Next Gen 911 and how 911 caller data comes into our dispatch center uh, and how that information is displayed to districting for fire departments based on response time from fire halls to redistricting for commissioners based on census data. Uh, and then it's, it's operational stuff like tax parcel splits and a, and a whole host of custom web built applications. Um, some kind of current examples would be like the COVID hub, where we, throughout the pandemic, we're communicating information to the public through that, uh, or our vacation rental dashboard would be another example of a public-facing custom-built web application. And then on the radio communication side, <coughs> that program supports and manages multiple public safety communication systems and a whole bunch of critical infrastructure uh, that supports those systems as well as other wireless services throughout the county. And so that includes things like cell service, broadcast radio like WTIP and Minnesota Public Radio, and then of course the armor system uh, which is used by every public safety agency that operates inside of Cook County. Uh, additionally through policy and contract management uh, the radio communications program provides management of tower site properties and the tenants who use the county owned towers uh, and facilities to provide those wireless services. Uh, 
our vision is great services always available. And this is something that my predecessor worked with us on and as a vision should be, it's a, a benchmark uh, or a goal that we align our daily work and projects <coughs> to. It's something that we, we work towards every day. Uh, and true to that strategic planning form, we also have uh, strategies and projects that are associated with them that we align our projects to, to support that mission and vision. Uh, the first one being infrastructure excellence, and this is a, a never-ending process that you know, really to keep pace with changes in technology. And it's something that we always see there being a need for. And the fact that our infrastructure is in really good shape speaks to the commitment that we have to it as being really the strategy that underpins the rest of them. You know, without a baseline stability from your infrastructure, your ability to deliver on everything else is really quickly diminished. And so projects under this strategy are gonna focus on things like redundancy of systems, optimization of equipment, security, both physical and cyber, cloud services, uh, regular replacement schedules, tower replacement and upgrades get categorized under that infrastructure excellence. Uh, support contracts have a role there, as well as uh, remote monitoring of our tower sites and our server rooms. Uh, strategy two, uh, MIS processes. My predecessor <laughs> liked to refer to this as the last mile because it's often the one that doesn't always get done or is last to get done. Uh, but luckily for us, she left us in really great shape and with a great base for these. So we have a lot of really good policies um, and our, our service level agreements in particular stand out as something to me that's really invaluable. It's really what allow us to um, have that back and forth communication with the departments that we support and make sure that we're on the same page of what's needed, what's expected of us, what we can deliver on, um, but also serve as a, a, a baseline to have a conversation if there's needs that need to be met there that aren't and how we can best address them, whether that's us internally or facilitating some other service to make sure that what is needed gets done. Um, Moving on to number three, e-government. <coughs> um, once you have that good baseline of infrastructure and some well-defined processes, uh, you, can, you can build up from there. And so some current examples we have of e-government solutions would be our GIS projects, including the rebranding and launching of our GIS uh, public data portal and the map gallery that was created there, it's a public facing one, and some, some kind of Staples of e-government are online payments, property information, and taxes, and of course we have those. And, and some newer internal facing ones that we've been working on is, is the expansion of SharePoint and OneDrive, and that's really allowing our users to employees to access internal data from anywhere in a, a simple and secure way. Um, number four, mobile services. Uh, increasing cell service coverage throughout the county and tower infrastructure sustainability through our contracts and leases. So that combination of expanding services, but and part of those contracts as that service gets expanded, we secure revenue that in turn supports the replacement of the infrastructure uh, that supports that. At the same time, that expanded coverage provides a platform for GIS applications and other e-government applications that be, can be used in more areas throughout the county um, by both employees and citizens. So an example might be <coughs> the culvert and sign app that our highway department uses when they're out in the field, um, or the county map gallery that I just mentioned so that people will have access to from mobile devices wherever. And then internally for us, obviously, there's a, a focus on mobile device management. And then last, but certainly not least, customer service excellence. Uh, here we focus on things like regular replacement schedules, making sure the equipment that our employees and staff have are in good working order. Uh, training resources, making sure that they have the ability to educate themselves on the tools that they have available to them, and as well as remote support. So we're pushing that out and expanding our ability to help people remotely. And I will talk about a little bit of each 
division in a little more depth. So in IT or information technology, uh, we have two staff, one in each role. Um, this is Kirk Oberg, our systems administrator, and Melissa Rexroad, our IT technician. And so in addition to what you see there on the slide and the regular replacement of laptops and PCs and switches and servers, we also completed a pretty large list of projects in 2022 uh, that are, are pretty impressive and I'll, I'll list a few of them for you. Uh, the courthouse and community center and recycling center security systems were all replaced. Uh, the LEC security camera system and jail locking door control system was replaced. Firewall management server uh, migrated away from Minute when they ended their support and we had to find a new provider for that. Uh, that also allowed us to do a firewall gateway redesign. That's the physical hardware here that separates our network from the rest of the internet. And really that redesign uh, gave us a level of redundancy that we've never had before. Basically fully redundant for our network from two different buildings and they can transfer seamlessly. Um, other ones we worked with the auditor's office on a dedicated camera and data retention program for the Dropbox uh, to meet election security needs. Uh, we transitioned the courthouse, the highway department, and the LEC phone systems to 10-digit dialing to comply with Kerry's law. That was another one this year. Uh, Gas Boy, the fueling system that's used by the county and many of our partners, uh, required a <coughs> software upgrade and cloud connectivity this year, just updated and needed to be changed. We facilitated that. New County Intranet uh, and HR sites, SharePoint migration for our IT and radio communication. Basically, we used ourselves as the guinea pigs uh, to take our internal data and put it online onto SharePoint. And once that went well, that's something that we're now in the process of rolling out to other departments, taking their local data uh, on file servers and moving it to SharePoint. And that's um, starting with the sheriff's office and soil and water and so more projects coming up uh, remote desktop applications is a standard now we're rolling that out across as we build out new pcs and then we added communications and hr slash payroll to our help desk and our our help desk received over 1400 tickets in 2022 so it's roughly 25 or 30 tickets a week. And the vast majority of those are directed towards MIS. They come for us to do something. Um, but allowing other departments to access the service has a lot of benefits and just the ease and use and the consolidation, but the reporting in there is really beneficial as well. And so that service now includes us, MIS, our maintenance department, HR slash payroll, the public information coordinator and then also new to this year uh, we allowed the YMCA to make maintenance requests through our help desk and that obviously then we can help track and report those as well so a lot of good good work on the IT side and expansion of services on the GIS side this is one person a GIS analyst Kyle Oberg <coughs> Arguably, uh, GIS makes up around 80 to 90 percent of county data. It's huge. And so um, things like property data, uh, permits, wells, tax information, et cetera, is GIS data. Highway department information like culverts, uh, center lines, bridges, it's all GIS data. Public safety, uh, sheriff's office and their dispatch systems, or squads, emergency management, all has this large GIS anchor. And Kyle, our GIS analyst, is the, the keeper and the builder of this data. And he also has a, a really significant amount of operational tasks, include things like parcel splits, custom maps, the custom applications that we, we mentioned before. And uh, in 2022, some of the larger projects that we accomplished here are the rebrand, <coughs> excuse me, rebranding and launching of the GIS portal and the map gallery and open data portal. Uh, redistricting was done, uh, vacation rental dashboard, updates to the highway and sign, highway sign and culvert applications, 
uh, a ton of next gen 911 grant work we received grant from the state to do a lot of work on there pictometry which is the uh, high resolution aerial photography areas of the county on a regular rotation more of that was done updated photos there uh, and then s smaller things like uh, the courthouse building directory that's map based that was kyle as well um, and then updates to the covid hub that also took place and then on the radio communication side uh, this is also one person jay deku our radio communication analyst cook county owns 13 communication towers and then manages another eight in some capacity um, through the creation of a, a formal program we've established a vision policies and operations to manage this resource in a, in a very specific way man a key part of our radio communication vision is to balance the impact that towers have on natural environment uh, with the need for services and so we talk about it about minimizing impact while maximizing services and trying to find that line there historically many of the towers that we have uh, were built out of necessity to establish VHF communications for volunteer fire departments first responders uh, the sheriff and without a, a long-term plan those towers became a liability for the county the cost of replacement the cost of equipment maintenance staff and and contractor support and then through a lot of work we've done though we we no longer view them that way we view them as a an asset and our goal is through tenant contracts that the radio communication program will eventually cover the cost associated with not just tower management but also public safety communications and we've made a lot of work uh, a lot of progress towards that in the last few years and we'll make more in 2022 currently we have enough revenue coming in from those tower contract leases to replace the tower infrastructure that we have now and we look to expand that out to other public safety communication systems as that grows and so our towers are from a financial perspective in a place of indefinite sustainability where they haven't been they're paying for themselves other benefits of managing the towers in the program this way um, is that when other entities need tower space it's available and and we can work with them um, so some of our partners that are tenants on our towers include the u.s forest service minnesota dnr u.s customs and border patrol the national weather service and noaa uh, just to name a few and because of the financial model with the towers um, it allows us to have them co-locate on our towers at prices that you know might otherwise be uh, financially prohibitive for us so we can sort of basically just have them cover the cost of electricity and because they're public safety and public service we feel like that's the right thing to do and our policies call that out project examples for the radio communication program in 22 would be uh, the bi-directional amplifier or bda uh, between colville and hovland that was improving armor coverage along highway 61 in that area uh, tower leases with the u.s forest service customs and border protection and then great river energy were all executed and those were leases for multiple towers for each one of those tenants and then we had tower inspections structural analysis guy wire tensioning on uh, several of the towers as well just as kind of operational projects that support uh, that infrastructure and then the expansion of site security and monitoring uh, which inform us of the condition of these assets and ultimately help us protect them long term and some of you may have seen this slide before but i wanted to talk a little bit about the benefit that we get uh, from managing all of these uh, together uh, so an example would be maybe a, a mobile device uh, it uh, with access to internet via cell service radio communication uh, an employee can use that to check email uh, look up historic permits in the field using SharePoint uh, gather GIS points and see the impact of those changes in real time um, update uh, e-permit while performing an inspection uh, other examples closer to us could be our radio communication analyst when he's out at a tower site 
Uh, he can look up and review contracts of individual tenants on a tower, review site drawings or photos, and identify who an antenna belongs to or if there's damaged equipment, who to contact, make that contact right from the site, and, and a lot of other benefits, and including the other ones that we're, we're using now. You mentioned the highway department and their ability to you know, drive along county roads and in real time update GIS data for things like culverts and signs using those custom built web applications that we have built for them. So there's a lot of overlap uh, in the services there. Success and challenges in 2022. So for the past several years, MIS uh, has really focused on creating infrastructure that is secure, uh, reliable, and sustainable from a financial perspective. Uh, in, in 2022, our department did a lot of work in this area again, uh, changes to our network topology and security infrastructure, uh, as well as securing support contracts to facilitate a higher level of support in these critical areas that we didn't have before. Um, and I, I talked about that in some detail already, but I, I don't think I'd be painting a full picture or giving full credit that's due to this department if I didn't talk a little bit about the impact of employee turnover. Um, in our department alone, everyone is either new or new to their position in 2022 with Kyle Oberg, our GIS analyst, is the only exception there. I'm counting myself, I started in September of 21, so in 22 I was newish as well, but Kirk Oberg, who's been here for, for over 15 years, he was new to his role as system administrator in 2022, and then uh, Jay Deku and Melissa Rexroad, our radio communication analyst and IT technician respectively, are both new to their roles in 2022. So we had a lot of training requirements and learning curves of our own that needed to be overcome, but then, you know, as you're all aware, the rest of the organization dealt with this as well. Uh, so, and I, I think there's general awareness that that impact of turnover has at the department level, and I think there's also sort of a general awareness that it has um, in the, you know, in terms of the potential loss of institutional knowledge. Um, but for us, specific to us, I wanted to mention it from the operational impact, the perspective that that, that it has on us. We received 95 onboarding and offboarding tickets in 2022. And I, to clarify how we calculate that, if somebody leaves, that's an offboarding ticket. If somebody's hired, that's an onboarding ticket. If somebody internally transfers, that's an offboarding and an onboarding ticket. So just don't want to make that number seem higher than it is, but for us, a lot of the work is the same. And so when we receive one of these, I mean, from an offboarding standpoint, often it's time sensitive. You gotta stop what you're doing. Uh, access needs to be restricted. So individuals need to have their accounts locked and passwords reset. Uh, email needs to be captured and forwarded to a supervisor. Automatic replies have to be created. From a hardware perspective, the computer and mobile device need to be collected and wiped so that they can be repurposed. Uh, data documents and communication needs to be preserved and set up so that the appropriate people have access to it. It could be <coughs> supervisor or replacement, often both. And then onboarding is much of the same, but in reverse. So it's, right, I mean, it, new equipment um, needs to be set up before their start date. Uh, new accounts and permissions need to be created. Everything from Active Directory and Office 365, that's email, Teams, SharePoint, Help Desk, calendars, phones, all of it. It's, it's a lot of work. Uh, and then training is huge with new users. So just bringing them up to speed on our systems and processes. There's a large operational impact uh, to that amount of turnover. And really, I, I mention it just so that I can just say that with all of this, our own learning curves and our own onboarding hurdles and that operational impact, uh, MIS completed 34 large projects in 2022. And to me, that really shows uh, how hardworking and capable that small group is. And um, because uh, we've been doing this for a while, I can actually look back <coughs> and see that we've completed 214 projects in the last eight years. <coughs> and so 34 projects in 2022 is actually above our average. It's a lot. And as you can see from the slide here, not only do we track our projects, but we track them 
uh, by the strategic goal that supports our mission and vision. And so in 2022, 50% uh, of our projects were infrastructure, uh, infrastructure excellence. And so this was scheduled equipment replacements, but also the firewall management server migration that I mentioned, the uh, security systems at the county buildings, the outdoor BDA, uh, bi-directional amplifier, and the tower site security monitoring are all examples of 2022 infrastructure projects. Um, our MIS processes, 10% uh, this year. We had a PSAP cybersecurity assessment that would be a good example of a process improvement project. Uh, E-government, 31%. Uh, redistricting and the rebrand and launch of the GIS public data portal. Uh, and then adding communications <coughs> and, and HR to the help desk. And then customer service excellence was 9%. And because we spent so much time on infrastructure, I wanted to talk a little bit about the importance of it. Uh, there's a cost, although hard to calculate, to the productivity lost uh, because of downtime. And from a security standpoint, with lots of things happening uh, out there in the public systems through hacking and ransomware, um, issues like that, it's, it's really a constant battle in network hardware and best, pa best practices. Uh, older equipment and software that's not properly updated pose vulnerabilities and risks to county business and the private and public data that we protect and we're responsible for. Um, that said, IT can't be a black hole, it's a utility and it needs to be managed that way. Um, it's got to be reliable in performance and stable and predictable in cost. And I feel like we've done a really good job of that, especially over the last few years. Going back to 2017, our capital requests range from 74,000 to 84,000. And that's not a trend going up, it's an up <coughs> and down based on the equipment that's being replaced in an ev any given year. And in 2023, <clears throat> it, it looks like an outlier, but it's not. That number went up to 103,000, but 15,000 of that is from our Sheriff's Office MDCs that had mobile data computers, the devices and their laptops and their squads that had previously been paid for out of the sheriff's office. So it's not a net gain from the county. That's just from one department now to ours. And then the other 4,000 is directly related to the increase in total number of county employees, something that's just outside of our control. And that's just laptops, monitors, UPSs, keyboard mice, all that capital that's associated with that. And we have made <clears throat> the switch largely to hosted in cloud services. And as we do that, we spend more on professional contracts while reducing the cost of hardware and software internally. Financially, they sort of balance each other out, um, but the change frees up our staff to do a lot of other work and reduces the additional staff and overtime. And, um, Really, it's what's allowed us to maintain our staffing levels since 2012, while the organization has really grown around us since then. And in 2012, that additional staff was the creation of the radio communication program. So our, our IT and GIS hasn't grown or changed significantly further back. And then lastly, before open it up for other uh, questions here. <clears throat> we also track our projects uh, by customer. And so here you can see our enterprise projects, uh, the things that impact all county employees, uh, often infrastructure and network security. Um, we track citizen things that would be uh, citizen related projects that would be things like cell service on towers, uh, COVID hub would count there. And then uh, multiple department projects would be like pictometry, multiple departments use that information. Or uh, our, our culvert app is used both by the highway department and soil and water, uh, would be an example there. So it's a handful of departments, but not all departments. And then department specific projects, uh, 
the LEC security camera and door control system would be an example there. That's an infrastructure project, but it's all for one department. And then our internal projects, uh, things that are just for MIS, uh, policy development, process improvement, uh, our tower leases, and the PSAP cybersecurity assessment would be an example of that. And then lastly, uh, some of our planned projects for 2023. This is a sample of what we have planned. Um, <clears throat> SharePoint and OneDrive to replace department and personal drives, respectively, is something we're moving forward with. Uh, this is going to allow the reduction of in on-premise storage and allow us to have fewer but higher quality servers. Uh, that's consolidation and optimizing of our on-prem, our on-site infrastructure, uh, but also providing a cost savings. We're going to have less servers overall that need to be replaced. Um, more end-user trainings, MIS department cross-training, and a review and update of our service level agreements. Uh, we're currently exploring options to reduce inefficiencies and expand the capabilities in our HR and payroll systems. That's an ongoing project. There are currently two uh, separate systems. We're looking at that potentially moving and consolidating those. Uh, an increase in revenue and expanded services from our radio communications program uh, and and low cost and low impact strategies to improve uh, security across the organization. So we're looking at multi-factor authentication as a requirement for more at risk or targeted users and eventually probably everyone across the organization as well as uh, annual required security awareness training. Uh, just something that we can help people be more aware of the risks that are out there and, and kind of bring that floor up. And then a lot of continued development of department specific applications. Uh, a big one that Kyle is working on right now with James and Brian and the folks at CRBPS who are doing our capital improvement plan is a facility management application, something that's going to allow our maintenance to track and, and record uh, the changes and repairs and maintenance that they make and that change overall to our uh, building infrastructure so that that can be reflected in capital improvement planning going forward and used to just kind of better manage the, the workload there. So a lot of good projects coming up in 2023. That's all I got. That was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Commissioner Storley. Thank you. Wow, yeah. <laughs> you're a large cog in a wheel here, <laughs> very large, <laughs> and I appreciate it very much. I am going to bring up something that you didn't cover, only because nine years ago when I was given my county laptop, um, I made the mistake of looking at my own personal email. Bad decision. Because even with um, everybody looking at our county um, website and everything, once in a while spam comes in and we're notified of that. Or if something looks odd that we shouldn't open, don't open it. And so from a little experience nine years ago, which wasn't drastic, I have never used my laptop for my personal email. Even if my own laptop goes down at home, I take care of that. I don't use <coughs> my county one. Just avoids a lot of problems. We appreciate that. <laughs> Mr. Hawkins. <clears throat> yeah, actually, I have lots of questions, but I'm not going to ask them all here. But I was making notes <laughs> while you were talking. Training for staff, I think, is really important, and especially if you have new positions. Do we have a skill soft training program? Is it worth anything <laughs> for it, your department? It is, but it's underutilized. And I okay. think part of the problem with Skillsoft is that it is so big. It, yeah. There's so much there. Um, but what I'm hopeful that we can do is create a, a recommended reading list or okay. recommended programs in Skillsoft and eventually maybe even tailor that based on department or job type, job title. Um, there's, you know, there's everything there. You can get real high level Microsoft certifications in Skillsoft down to uh, 
how to deal with combative people at the window uh, up to leadership training. So there's a, a huge range of there, but there's how to use uh, Outlook and calendars and things like that that are really just kind of end user stuff that I think general awareness would, would save us a lot of time and also save end users time if they can, they know that the resource is there to help themselves. And do you have a way to track which departments are using it or which people in the organization are using that? We do, and that's okay. that's really a nice feature of Skillsoft that we like. We're actually leaning towards currently Skillsoft as being the one that we would use for our security awareness training because it shows who's done it and who hasn't. <laughs> so it, it actually records once you've completed it. And oh, when you re okay, because I, I started a whole bunch that are way over my head and more for Brady, but I wondered, is somebody looking to see that I'm trying to be an auditor? <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. They, okay, so can. that I wondered so how your, much it was Your track. Skillsoft account is tied to your, your user account, your email address here at the county, okay. and that uh, it records everything that you've done and when you've done it. So we can see, you know, when's the last time someone took this training and um, what trainings have they taken? It se I agree. It seems like it has lots of information that's good for our organization, but it can be overwhelming deciding, well, what do I want to learn today? It's not organized well. Yeah. So. And it's, that's the hurdle that I see with it, too, and I yeah. think narrowing that down for people and having maybe a, a tailored course or a, you know, a recommended reading list of, of programs would be a good step in the right direction of helping with that. Okay. Um, next thing, oh, 1,400 tickets on help desk wow yeah I remember when I was an employee here and hated to do a help desk ticket and then would say oh you're just here help fix and they made me do a help t desk ticket we try and I say well I think you've got everybody on working on that now so good job it's, it's an um, improvement because it I is important to track to your work yes them, but it, it does it's very helpful for us to track our work and that's so if you hear me or our, our other staff asking that's why and now sitting in this chair instead of that chair i totally understand why it's important to do that and track it so that i can say yeah your department is getting its work done whatever <laughs> so thanks staff for doing that um pictometry update when's our next scheduled time you're going to come to ask for money to update our pictometry uh i think it's it's this year i'll have to get I back wondered. to you on that i think it is um and if i rem remember right i think historically that's worked with uh dusty in the recorder's office and the unallocated fund there um i would expect that's what we'll propose going forward and continue on that seems to work for everyone um, but I, I believe you're right that it is this year we'll have to have that conversation again okay um, just let me see nope that's all the questions I, I just made notes for other things all right Commissioner White um, redundancy is really important Kyle Olberg we have a backup for Kyle you don't and I mean that's a very serious I know I agree fully um, what I'm proposing uh, this year I've had kind of early conversations with Brady about is that Kyle uh, actually because of a lot of grant work he did for soil and water in their I believe it was their culvert grant we're receiving about fifteen thousand dollars and what I'd like to do is uh, seed that money for a capital account for GIS that could be used uh, for GIS projects like pictometry, uh, but it could also be held in reserve and used for uh, consulting or if we have other GIS needs that we could contract for services for both as a backup to him, but also to um, broaden up his ability so he can focus on other things. Uh, if there's money available there, uh, that's something that we've looked at using in that way. But to answer your question right now, no, I don't have a backup for Kyle. We're basically one deep at everything uh, with, as best we can, cross-training between each other. We can do some things, but to sit here and say that any one of us could do what Kyle does is not accurate. 
Okay. And then uh, we're going to cloud base for a lot of issues. Yep. All of this depends on electricity. Yep. Dependable electricity. Yeah. All the time. What do we do? I mean, I'm not even talk about clouds getting hacked into because I can't even. I mean, there's something. But let's just go down to this level, electricity. Could you explain how we guarantee that we have electricity? Sure. Uh, this well, might be a Brian question, but. Well, I, I mean, we, we definitely are a, a key <laughs> stakeholder in that conversation. And our, uh, what we've had happen in the last year, we've had a couple incidents where one of our generators at one of our buildings failed and then also uh, the city generator unbeknownst to us was down and so the backup to the backup didn't run and that burned us we we lost some equipment a thousand dollars or so in equipment based on that and then we had staff time rebuilding rebuilding because of that what i would like to see long term would be uh, large battery backups things like a, a tesla wall or something like that in our server rooms uh, that keep our infrastructure just secure and don't rely on electromechanical moving parts uh, things to to start um, so that's something that i think will probably come up in future conversations uh, especially with capital improvement I, at a minimum i would see room for that conversation throughout that process uh, but in the short term we've also done things like uh, we're working on a, an mou with the city right now that says hey if your generator's not working can you let us know and if our one of our generators at one of our key buildings isn't working can we reach out and ask you to potentially run your generator longer than you might otherwise just until if it's say a windstorm like we had christmas time just until that power stabilizes. And so operationally, I think there's improvements that we can make in the meantime, um, but from a hardware and infrastructure standpoint, um, I think uh, a larger battery backup in our server rooms would be the best solution to that. And I would keep the generators in place. I mean, I, I, I think if Brian was here, he'd tell you that our generators run weekly and they probably had six or seven hundred reliable starts in a row and it was just the one time that they didn't that really gets everyone worked up but when they don't it's a big deal so great other questions Brady what do you see um, you know emails spam hacking attempts and do you, you see the attempts coming in? Are you able to track that and the, and the blockage of it? We are. And is it changing? What do you see? I, over the last year, I wouldn't say it has changed a ton. Um, and, and why I use that time frame is because that's when we transition to our new firewall setup, uh, the new server, uh, uh, that we use to manage them as well as uh, the gateway managements and we can see things like that both through uh, Outlook and Office 365 but also in the firewall and it generates weekly and monthly reports it shows us who the most targeted users are uh, it shows us uh, within uh, the within the organization yeah so whose email is getting the most spams or who email is getting the most malware attempts and our firewall's filtering that out, but it shows us who's most at risk, and that kind of guides us on things like where should we prioritize two-factor authentication? Who, who needs that most? Then we also look at the impact to the organization, who has access to data and systems that could really be problematic if we had a bad actor in there. It seemed, my impression is it's, it's working. I seem to have fewer fishy emails than I did five years ago or ten years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think, I mean, it's our, the system that we have in place, uh, constant upgrades, it's part of the service contract that we pay for that, software upgrades, and we're on a pretty aggressive hardware replacement as well, and, but it's, you know, it's, it's key to keep those things updated and in good working order, obviously, um, but I think the, 
just general improvements in that area, especially with, with email uh, or probably what you're experiencing. Office 365 is really good at it and anything that Office 365 doesn't catch, our firewall does and vice versa. So between the two, uh, we're in pretty good shape, but it doesn't mean that they don't get through. And so security awareness and not clicking on fishy things is extremely important. Do you have any idea where, you know, when, when something's on a cloud service, where it actually goes? I mean, mm -hmm. in, yeah. like you're doing this on a cloud service and you know exactly where it's actually going, this one, or is it like a distributed network? In it? It's that one. So you, you can, uh, and we haven't done this much, but you can, you can look up and see where uh, Microsoft has their storage facilities. You can see where AWS has their uh, cloud storage facilities. In fact, often if you try to track uh, an IP address back to a location, it'll just come back to a giant uh, server house, warehouse somewhere that's owned by Okay. Amazon. So you can actually track it back. Okay. Yep. Yeah. But they, they back them up and they move them around. Yeah. It's really just, you know, it's a service that they provide and it's really called out about, you know, guarantee of uptime and the backups and they don't always guarantee or say where your data is going to live. It could change from one day to the next. Okay. It's a snapshot, a yeah. point in time. Yeah. Right. That was a joke for Brady. <laughs> 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 Thanks. Oh, goodness. Other uh, questions? Yeah. I, oh, did you have more, Brady? I could, but you go ahead. No, you go for it. Well, I just had one. Uh, like, what's the difference between a BDA and a tower? It's good you know, question. Equipment on it is. Yeah, so the, the BDA or bi directional amplifier is relying on existing coverage and what's called a donor antenna. So up high, that antenna receives signal from a decent area and then it takes that signal and amplifies it and sends it down towards a targeted area with what are called service antennas. So it's just a signal booster whereas a dedicated armor tower site has a lot of extra associated equipment and costs um, from Motorola that MnDOT is charged with maintaining and it's part of uh, a network uh, of microwave towers across the state and it also has um, considerations for license and subscriptions from Motorola and needs upgrades. So it's just a much more complicated site um, than what a BDA is. And you can't put uh, anyone else on a BDA. No, and so there's a diminishing return. I mean, a BDA is, is by design used to fill holes. You can't build a network yeah. off of BDAs, uh, but a BDA can be used uh, in a handful of cases to fill key areas where coverage is lacking and it's much less expensive upfront and long term than building a full blown armor site. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, Commissioner Mills, you. No, you can go ahead. Um, well, you brought it up. Armor and Motorola, could you explain why you're suddenly bringing up the word Motorola? Sure, I can. So, Armor is the state uh, radio system that meets what's called a P25 standard and that P25 is just project 25 it took them 25 tries to get it right that's the standard that they apply <laughs> and every radio manufacturer does have radios that meet that standard so can you use a Kenwood or a, a Harris radio on the armor system yeah and some people do on the infrastructure side Motorola won the state bid, the state contract, to build out the system. So they are the manufacturers of the <coughs> infrastructure. That doesn't mean that we can't still use those Harris or, or other brand radios. Um, we can, but the infrastructure that the state maintains is Motorola. And that's just because that's who provided the best proposal and that's who the state went with. And then could you speak to security on these, these are radios, Motorola radios. Could you speak yep. to how those, well, I'll use the word because I kind of know this. Well, encryption, sure. about the encryption standards that are required. Yeah, so the only agency 
uh, for Cook County that uses encryption is our sheriff's office. And the, the current concern around encryption has to do with CJIS data and criminal justice data. And the BCA and the FBI are looking to have the state of Minnesota move to a new level, a new standard for encryption than what our state uh, shared armor resources, shared channels that everyone has access to use. It poses a financial and operational challenge to the state. Uh, luckily, the state has a really good governance structure in place where they've done projects like this before. So they have a, a documented and proven change management process where at some point, but to be compliant, we will have to move from what is called DES OFB encryption to AES, which is the state's, uh, the Fed's level of encryption when using, when talking about criminal justice data, law enforcement. <coughs> and on, on that note, I would say that when our armor radios at the sheriff's office were replaced a couple of years ago, we made sure that they were capable of both DES and AES. So we in Cook County are prepared to make that transition whenever the rest of the state uh, is ready to do so as well. So we're from an equipment standpoint, we're ready to go. It's just that if we went now, we wouldn't be able to talk to anyone because they're not ready yet. So we're ready. And we have all Motorola? We just started rolling out and testing Kenwood radios to fire departments. They were also just approved uh, by a user group of the State Emergency Communications Board for use on the armor system. They kind of just they work with P25, but they also like to just kind of put it through their paces and, and make an official recommendation. And that's come through. And there's some significant savings there, um, but we're, we're in a small groups, two, three radios here or there. We're rolling them out to individual to fire departments for them to try and see if it's something that they might be interested in purchasing. Um, but aside from that, we are all Motorola, um, our single biggest purchase was an AFG grant, assistance to firefighter grant, a FEMA fire grant in 2014 uh, that purchased the vast majority of the armor radios in the county. And that was um, Motorola. Commissioner Mills. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Rowan. Wonderful update. Um, I, the first thing I want to say is just uh, kudos, uh, bravo, I mean, the seamless transition that you provided during a very tumultuous time in the department with operations, with all the staff, all the staff turnover, <laughs> it's just really impressive. And thank you for your leadership and your hard work with that because whereas we might not see it as much, you're down in it and I know it was a huge weight on your shoulders. So well done and, and, and just flying colors, I'd say. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, in, in the AMC Public Safety Committee, there's a lot of talk about armor radios, and a lot of counties are not in as good a situation as we are. And granted, a lot of counties are much larger uh, usage-wise uh, than us, so there's a lot more radios out there. Um, and so it might just be a good to remind us just about the replacement schedule for the armor radios and, and how we're preparing to do that. And um, it sounds like what's being talked about is for a lot of state funding to come replace radios for counties who were not prepared. Um, so um, we may not get that immediate dollar benefit, but um, but we got some pride out of it. And, uh, and, and, maybe, and maybe we will get some just with our replacement schedule. Yeah, yeah. Our, our department, MIS, um, we only own a handful of radios. You know, that we're that we actually are responsible for replacing but we work closely with other departments that have been doing a good job of replacing their radios and we work with other agencies the school is a good example of that they've been on a regular replacement schedule um, sheriff's office has done a good job the highway department has done a good job of that and you know they're budgeting to to make that investment in the infrastructure to make sure that they can replace it when they need to um, some of our other Fire departments don't have the ability to allocate as much money as it 
takes to do that at the same level. Um, but that's not a unique problem to us and the state's aware of that. Uh, we're in the process of submitting our recommendations for uh, the 2023 uh, SHSP uh, needs assessment. So it's, it's grant funding uh, that could potentially come our way and could potentially be used for things like replacing mobiles and portable armor radios and would apply to fire departments and others. Awesome. Yeah, and that is the biggest concern is the fire departments throughout the throughout the state. So what does a radio cost? Depends on the radio's capabilities. Uh, we're looking at sort of a range between uh, 2500 3000 uh, up to even six or seven thousand dollars per radio. It's more than all of my cars combined. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Go ahead. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Again, thank you, Rowan. Um, and then just where do you see the future of um, blockchain technology and AI and um, Web 3.0? Just kidding. <laughs> 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 uh, but, and, and I did, I did note um, one of the slides I really liked was everything is connected. I thought that was, um, I mean, we're getting pretty meta there, but I think that just goes to show how integral all of our systems are, whether it be the the technology or just the departments all working together um so thanks for putting that in there yeah other questions or comments well thank you so much for a really thorough report and we appreciate all the work that you and your staff does thank you for the time mm -hmm. thank you thank you <laughs> we're going to take a five minute break at this point in time and um, then we'll be back. Thank you.
have the auditors ever done a pub a presentation? We're live. Oh. <coughs> I will ask that when the audit. All right, <laughs> welcome back everyone. Um, I'd like to Welcome you back to our Cook County Commissioners uh, meeting today, Tuesday, February 28th. Um, we're just about ready to begin item number six, which is our Otter Treasurer, Brady Powers. Thank you, Madam Chair. So this is uh, actually a good subject to follow uh, Rowan's update. It's technology related. Um, it's something we became aware of uh, through our involvement in the GFOA Government Finance Officers Association, a national association who brought this to our attention, uh, Lori Erickson, first of all, who uh, is on that uh, group mm -hmm. as a member. And, uh, but this is, this is related to re legislation that actually was approved in December of last year. It's called Financial Data Transparency uh, Act, and the law mandates that governments are going to report financial information using uniform reporting categories or data standards, which may require costly updates to our financial systems or extensive workarounds. The actions taken by the U.S. Treasury and U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission to implement the law could open the door to directing the use of specific technologies for reporting governmental financial information and a mandate for using a specific technology for government and nonprofit financial reporting could lead to a standard template that would actually reduce transparency by eliminating the details specific to our unique functions and services. It could also lead to new to adding new reporting categories that would require changes to our underlying financial system. So the stated purpose of the new law is to provide greater transparency in financial reporting, but it could have the opposite effect um, by creating the standard template. And this is be mandated for, it's primarily related to municipal securities. So this would be states, cities, counties, water districts, public power systems, public gas systems, public hospitals, on and on and on. Anyone that issues bonds uh, as a governmental <coughs> municipal entity and then reduce all of our financial data to one standard, which of course, uh, just from the list you can see how different our functions are and how we describe this information to each of our groups, whether it's state, county, city, et cetera, and how much of that data uh, you would lose by standardizing that. We have, our, our standards would be completely different from a water district, public utility standards for financial reporting. You would lose all of that de detail. So, and you can see here, from the list from the Government Financial Officers Association, the letter they provided, uh, national organizations all across the spectrum, American Public Gas, American Public Power, American Public Transportation, Water Works, Association of Metropolitan Water Agencies, School Business Offices, uh, International City, <coughs> County Management Associations, National Association of Clean Water Agencies, National Association of College University Business Officers, our National Association of Counties, uh, Health and Education National Association Finance Authorities, State Treasurers, State Housing Agencies, National Governors Associations, the National League of Cities, the National Special Districts Coalition, United States Conference of Mayors, all are concerned and worrying. They've all signed on to this letter asking that we all join to put, uh, to ask our legislators to look hard at this new legislation and how it's already passed, but how it's put into effect and applied. So I actually, uh, I asked Rowan, I was kind of hoping he'd stay, but um, 
what does some of this mean? Uh, it talks about machine readable standards. So that would mean something like uh, our financial report, which I just gave you, is in a word form. Somehow that would have to be transformed into some other kind of machine readable form. Uh, Excel is a possibility, but it sounds more complicated than even that when Rowan took a look at it. So uh, a lot of potentially high cost to do this and for what purpose? So since it's related to uh, financing, government bonds, it's, we're talking about the um, probably our rating agencies, the issuers of bonds, the buyers of bonds, and all of the middlemen that work in that area apparently are who would be the beneficiaries of this type of service. And it's interesting that they did not uh, discuss any of this with any of these entities, any of their associations, when they came up with this plan. It's, it's pretty obvious that they did not reach out to see how uh, to make this, if this is actually something that's beneficial to all of us. It's obviously beneficial to a small, uh, well, not small, small, small group maybe, but a very large influential, uh, uh, in a sense, their influence and power, uh, Wall <coughs> Street, et cetera, um, but did not reach out to all of us who will be, um, let's say, suffering the consequences. So. I know I was very concerned um, reading the information you shared and then also going to the NACO website and reading about this and that NACO has huge concerns about this piece of legislation um, and that it creates data standards that really open the door to, to specific technologies. Um, it, um, I'm just very, very leery of this. And it's also another unfunded mandate which I think we're all very tired of. Tired of. You're going to do this, but we're not going to give you any funding. So that's the other part of it. Um, we would, if we were going to be supportive of this, we would need resources to implement it, and there aren't any available to us. Um, what have other commissioners found in their research on this topic? Commissioner Hawkins. Well, all eight of Minnesota's uh, representatives voted for this. <clears throat> kind of surprised me that we have this much and we know I, I'd heard about this I kind of not really paid a whole lot of attention thinking oh they're gonna fix it with all these groups on here that Brady listed off opposed to this I, I kind of just thought oh no big deal but the fact that all of these groups national groups got ignored and I so I don't know what that says about our representatives at, in Congress, because um, it was—it's not just Republican Democrat; they all voted it's for bipartisan. Right. So I, I don't know. I suspect it has to do with the power of lobbyists in yeah. Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. who push something through. They give one side of the argument; they're very persuasive. It's—it's it's in the vein of a lot of, let's say, if. Uh, technological efficiency um, probably sounds very good on the surface and um, that's my guess that it was pushed through fast and uh, without research without people sitting there in hearings uh, that maybe even weren't aware of it um, at the time and it got pushed through and it it got pushed through on a, uh, a defense authorization act so Probably on that's page 300 some, and yeah. something. Since yeah. it has to do with municipal securities largely, that sounds like a non-transparent type of a bill to put something this through on. Commissioner so Hopkins. I support um, letting, sending a letter <coughs> saying our concerns. I also support making sure we send it to all our representatives and encourage them that when they pass laws at the federal level that affect county counties <laughs> that they make sure they check with the uh, um, our county national groups to make sure counties really do support this 
it's kind of it if it really frustrates me that they would have this many groups opposed saying working on being opposed to this legislation and yet they all still voted for it well if there is no one that would disagree I would be happy to draft a letter and get it off to all our representatives Commissioner Mills um well it's very complicated yes and uh, because it's so complicated I think you have to be really careful uh, and I do believe this is where we will be going but because I mean certainly we have all these concerns and they're very 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 valid um, and I agree with them a hundred percent I just don't think we're ready for it um, and and uh, I would like to move in this direction but I think we need to it's very important we we realize how to do it it's about that process and when is the timing right how would the cost be covered blah, blah, all that kind of stuff so um, I, I would agree 100% that I want to share concerns um, it just and it, it's kind of funny kind of not funny because it does relate to that just kidding question that I gave Rowan about web point three web 3.0 and, and then blockchain technology at some point uh, I, I really do believe we won't need auditors everything will just be there and verified instantly and um, cross-referenced and uh, not tomorrow <laughs> no no and that's what I'm saying you can't just do it by passing a law it's gonna take a lot of time and a lot of processes need into place I could see a lot of people squirming and uh, I'm not suggesting we we get rid of our auditor or, or auditors in general or, or or you know our, our partners but it just um, it, it's pretty incredible where technology is going uh, I'm sure you've heard about AI in the news yeah, yes. you know and this kind of is in that vein you know there's a lot of change happening and it's scary uh, but also exciting but right now I fully support sharing our concerns and um, and they're huge so yeah and if and if it is well thought out and there's a lot of information behind it then they should be sharing that right. with all of these organizations yes. Yes. that were listed here. Clearly there needs to be more discussion. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Commissioner White, you look like you're there ready to say diverse, something. There is strength in diversity. I mean on so many different levels, so we're just all gonna join one big <coughs> one big pie in the sky and like let her go. That just seems I mean, talk about losing Kyle Oberg. That's one thing, but we're going to depend on one one reporting source, one tracking source, one. There's an absurdity to that. Write that letter strongly, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I will take that direction. Any other comments or questions? All right, um, I'm going to just. Um, talk a little bit about Administrator Yorkie's one item. Um, we're going to do a what the kids call a do-over. <laughs> um, and on March 14th, have our hearing for the Caribou Lake um, Surface Water Ordinance. We had a wonderful public hearing back on Valentine's Day, and it did not get noticed in the paper. Um, not to the fault of the Cook County News Herald. This is on us. All right, so um, anyway, mark your calendars, March 14th for that do-over. <laughs> All right, and that'll be at 9 a.m. embedded <coughs> into our meeting. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion to schedule a hearing at 9 a.m. on Tuesday, March 14th, 2023, for the purpose of receiving public comments on a proposed ordinance to restrict weight surfing on Caribou Lake and Midson Township. Thank you so much, Commissioner Mills. Is there support? Support. Thank you, Commissioner Storley. We have a motion in support. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We have a public hearing. Item eight, employee concerns and commissioner concerns. Um, commissioner Storley, let's start with you. Um, I don't have any concerns, <laughs> but I do have <coughs> a compliment to AMC <coughs> for their wonderful turnaround and providing the conference um, virtually 
I, I don't believe in the past it's ever been canceled, and if it was, it was canceled because we never had Zoom 10 years ago. So it was a big deal, and um, I certainly enjoyed being part of the opening session and the committee chairs sending out information, being part of all that, and downloading all of the information, too, I thought was, was um, fabulous for that. I have one more thing, but somebody else can go, go ahead. ahead. That's quite all right. So our next conference is a leadership conference coming up in Nisswa, uh, March 29th to the 31st at Grandview Lodge. How do we want to uh, move forward with that? I believe, I don't think right now registration is there. I thought I saw something. I have not seen registration. I've seen an announcement yes. for the conference, but not registration. So are, what do you think? Should we handle it ourselves, have one person um, do Why it? don't you funnel everything to me and okay. then we'll make sure that registration gets done. <clears throat> right, because it's a really good um, leadership conference. And then the next week, um, I believe District 1, our district, um, April 7th, mm -hmm. we'll be meeting in Aiken. So that'll be coming up the following week. Right. Thanks for doing that, Ann. Sure thing. Happy to <clears throat> do that. Um, Commissioner Hawkins, anything? Um, so I had my first LEO. Electric L L no. Electric <laughs> <laughs> no, that's <laughs> yellow. Law enforcement. Labor, li no. Elected officials. Yeah. For jet. The whole thing doesn't make sense to me yet. I, they're, oh, they changed their acronym to make it more clear, and that doesn't work for me yet. So, but I had my first meeting by Zoom there, and that was interesting, and um, I was advocating for more training for trades, which I know um, Bobby and Grand Portage is working on, so mm. more to work to do there. Um, community Center, really good strategic planning initial session we had, um, just to make sure that you know, the Community Center Board is, we're all in agreement of what we see our Community Center mm -hmm. being or could be, or so the initial stages there. But um, Sarah's doing a good job with that. ARC meeting, um, they had the election of officers and Chairman, I mean, uh, Commissioner Gudermont is the chair of the ARC and I was elected vice chair. Heads up on Congratulations. that. Congratulations. Great. Thank you. I, I really don't know that I would say. Yeah. No, I'm excited to, I said teasing, um, I'll have to take some uh, Robert's Rules of <laughs> Order lessons from Commissioner Mills. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that sounds like trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but all right, that's well, all I have to report. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Commissioner White. Well. I just had, I don't have any, well, concerns, there are all sorts of them, but last Saturday, there were 27 community residents in attendance at the, well, we thought it would be the Hovland Town Hall for a hopefully uh, regular uh, monthly, I don't know what it would be, but um, coffee with a commissioner. I don't know how else to put it. The name's been used before. Mm -hmm. But we had 27 residents show up, plus uh, Commissioner Hawkins and then uh, Robbie Hass, the highway engineer. He, of course, was a star. Uh, but it was quite the inaugural event. Um, I arrived at the town hall the night before, turned the heat on, arrived at the town hall 9 o'clock. Saturday morning and uh, by quarter to 10, it was ascertained that the furnace is not working at all. The heat, the gas is on, everything's fine. So, scramble and um, people fell in place, arrived, showed up and we had the event in the basement of the uh, church next door. And it was, you know, there were people that were shoveling the walk and, I mean, because it's ice, it's, it's snow, it's everything. And the coffee was not ready by the time people showed up and it seemed nobody that was in charge knew how to make coffee because there were no coffee drinkers. And then we did get um, <coughs> the donuts from the 
do donut shop were made fresh and picked up at 9 a.m. for the 10 o'clock meeting. And between the donuts, the uh, uh, Fika coffee, and Roddy Haas, that's why everybody came. <laughs> and so the conversation was really good. Roddy fielded lots and lots of questions, answered, um, I think, to many people's satisfaction, told them things they never knew before. Uh, it was helpful. Uh, uh, Commissioner Salson was there to be able to give some why different, uh, there was a question about consultants, there was a question about, uh, and then Stace, uh, Commissioner Hawkins being there was really helpful too. And then um, besides the highway and bridges and all that information, the pro, uh, I had handouts about the session two um, capital improvement plan. Okay. Sure. Um, that generated more questions than, um, and I was able to assure those in attendance that I had gotten verbal commitment from the administrator and from uh, maintenance from Brian Silence that they would be more than happy to come and attend because it was very apparent that having the department head there who knew the answer to any question that came up was invaluable, was absolutely invaluable. And then at a meeting I had on Friday, um, uh, Allison McIntyre from Health and Human Services also made a commitment to come to one of these sessions. And that was another topic that people had questions on. And, you know, why, is, why are there so many people? What do they do? What are you, and it's like she would be the person to answer that. So. It was well attended. I was really, I'll have to get a lot more donuts next time. <laughs> I know how to make the coffee makers work. Um, yeah, we had done two and a half dozen donuts. Many people were, were polite and did not take any. And so we had one donut left at the end of the whole thing. <laughs> and I, neither, Stacy, we did not. I'm did not, you finally? Oh, yeah, we, I, I forced one, one on I you. I took one out at the very end, walking out, yes. Yeah. So, so it was... It was um, but only because it wasn't the last one, right? Correct. She didn't take the last one. I just <laughs> laid that. But, she, um, but it, was, it absolutely proved that this is the way to get information out to the taxpayers because they had questions that I hadn't thought of. They got information that is very valuable. And... Um, and how uh, the question was asked, how did you find out about this? And thank you very much to Brian at the News Herald. If you open up the paper, yeah. across the bottom, in really bold, big print, come on down to the whole Fulton Town Hall. And then um, it, was it was on WTIP. It was well. on WTIP. Thank you to Joe Fredericks for also saying, telling, talking about it during his hour right away, which he doesn't often do. And then um, it was on their, their <coughs> website. It was on uh, WTIP. It was on Boreal. And even Grand Marais State Bank put it on their internal thing for me. And then, uh, of course, the big one was a sign up at the, on, in the window at the Hovland Post Office. <laughs> <laughs> so posters always work well. Posters work really well, and um, it was a good bonding time. Well, thank you and for doing I that. And now I get to the post office and get my mail and leave a little more <laughs> efficiently than <laughs> trying to answer questions I don't know the answers to. Don't kid yourself there. <laughs> uh, they won't stop with it, that. They had been focused on the Arrowhead Trail, and what about? And so Robbie answered everything for them. That's great. And brought handouts too, which, yeah. So that's the biggie. Well, thank you much. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Mills. Well, well done. That's awesome. Uh, good turnout. And yeah, you had crisis. You had <laughs> resolution, teamwork, right? <laughs> and you had traits. It's uh, and and camaraderie, we, right? It's, we had attendance. We had, yeah. we had democracy in action. We had people wanting to know. And I, it, it's, it's how it's going to work, and it's it's really it's the best way. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, locally elected officials, as LEO, it's simple, but but so that's the 
locally elected official board versus the NEMOJET. That was the old acronym. NEMOJET also doesn't really, yeah. yeah, it's like Nemo and Jen, yeah, yeah so they yeah. tried to make it streamlined. But that is the primary focus, is that trades, right? Yeah. That's that and, and displaced workers. Um, and so, yeah, I think, yeah, I think your efforts will be, will be right on spot there. Thank you for taking that on. I'm curious about the makeup of that board, but we can talk um, later just because of all the commissioner turnover. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, just want to share with this board uh, the discussions we've been having around the HRA and the EDA uh, and after the um, resignation of Beth Drost from the EDA um, director position uh, there's been um, uh, quite a bit of interest in the possibility of merging the two the number one concern I would say uh, and correct me if, if I'm wrong is the potential loss of housing focus because uh, that is our primary need in Cook County and nobody uh, from from my take is wants any distraction from that and so it's very tricky because clearly the EDA has other roles and responsibility though for a time their uh, housing <coughs> has been the primary focus and so figuring out how all that can work um, is is no small task however um, the skills we have in our current HRA director leads me to believe that this could work and work well but uh, still lots of conversations happening I do feel like that's where things are moving or leaning when it comes down to it it is up to us the Cook County Board of Commissioners and the City Council to make that decision um, there can be recommendations from the HRA and the EDA about what what th they think or we think could be uh, good or, or better, um, but but when when it comes down to it, it's it's on us. So uh, it, please expect more conversations around that, and and, and um, happy to talk more about that if there's specific questions. There's really not a whole lot of answers at this point, I'd say, uh, and I'm. For my part, leaning heavily on uh, other people's experience and expertise, um, but I am—I um, did volunteer to be on a, a subgroup to kind of dive into that a little bit more. So, so maybe I will have more and better <coughs> answers for you in the future. But that's kind of the big thing I wanted to share today. All right, and I just want to kind of um, talk about um, AMC and the fact that in addition to. Uh, moving a number of the meetings to a, a virtual option that there were also some things that did not happen so there was supposed to be a tribal forum on Tuesday night that did not occur and so that is going to be rescheduled and it will be in person I'll be attending um, and then also I was supposed to testify at the Senate on Wednesday for waste management and the tax mm -hmm. committee and that got postponed it's occurring right as we speak mm -hmm. um, no commissioner in the state of Minnesota could be there to testify given the time because we're all in our county board meetings today um, so that was unfortunate um, the plan had been that I was going to be presenting um, in cooperation with Commissioner Gattel from uh, Bloomington and the Chanhassen area to talk about the difference between waste management in the metro area and waste management in rural communities so that we could educate the Senate on those differences. Um, so we hope that they are benefiting from using our PowerPoint today and um, the authors of the bill will, will be doing the testifying. Um, on a positive note, we did have an opportunity to meet with Senator um, Hosschild and Representative Scraba. Um, Although we had intended it was going to be a Cook County only meeting with them, there were five counties that met with them during that time. And so um, when you have 15 minutes and five counties, um, we, we agreed to speak about legislative priorities that benefited all five counties. And that would include Itasca, Kuchiching, St. Louis, Lake County, and Cook County. So, you know, things like PILT, I mean, the things that we're all familiar with. But I did send documents to both Senator Hosschild and Representative Scraba. Um, 
with all of our information, all of the documents that we um, actually shared, all the groups that shared with them on uh, February 10th, so they have all our specific information. Um, but I really appreciated still being able to interface with them, although it wasn't at the Capitol, um, it was still really a, a nice thing to do. Um, and lastly, on Saturday, why Commissioner White was um, up in Hovland with the um, town hall, I was at the Cook County Council on yes. Aging, and we had a big fundraiser that day, a big pancake breakfast, served 97 people that we counted. There may be a few others that um, after I left, but it was 97 when I left, and at the point I left, we had taken in over $1,100. So very, very successful event and brought a lot of community members together. I was sharing with Commissioner White, there were people there from Hovland who had committed to going to the breakfast and they will be coming to other town hall forums later. Or they sent their spouses to the town hall right. meeting. Right. And uh, there was more than one pancake breakfast fundraiser yes. on Saturday. There were two of them. Oh. Yes. Yeah, it was a busy Saturday, that's yes, for sure. Yes, indeed. But anyway, good news on that front. <coughs> um, other meetings to note, I am heading down when our meeting is finished to Mankato for uh, Planning Commission training on land use annually. We mm. have to make sure that we are updated on any changes in statute or um, any trends um, that we are seeing in um, the judicial world as we look at land management. and and planning decisions, so that will be really good, and I'll provide some updates for the board um, at our next meeting. And we have our sales tax report, and if there's nothing else, we are ready to be adjourned. I'm sure they can make a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Commissioner Mills. Is there support? Support. Thank you, Commissioner Storley. We have a motion and support. Any other questions or comments, <coughs> discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We are adjourned. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do the auditors ever come into a public pre or a board presentation? If they haven't for, I don't know, somewhere in the 10 to 15 years, they stopped. <laughs> doing that can I just ask that you have this conversation just yeah. the two of you and not with all commissioners here sure otherwise it's an open meeting violation yeah. okay and um, just so you're aware I'm going to send an email to all of you um, related to attorney Hicken is putting together a special meeting um, 